Okay, thank you very much for everyone that's uh, joining us for our summer webinar series here from Stepper School. Uh, thank you. We've got people from all over all over the world. We've got someone signing in from Japan, I, I gather, uh, Kuala Lumpur, the Middle East. So thank you ever so much. I'll just introduce these three old said Bergians, if I may. Firstly, we have Carl Ferns. Uh, he looks like a well-seasoned uh, pro boxer, but he's still in the uh, peak of his playing career. Um, he, he left here in 2006. Uh, he went, uh, 2007, went on uh, to play at South Sharks and uh, is currently just about to leave Lyon. Uh, he played 26 times for Sebba uh, and never lost in a brown jersey. Secondly, we've got Tom Casson, uh, played for South Sharks and then Harlequins and is now a rugby agent. He's extremely good uh, with the pro players, fantastic interpersonal skills, uh, and builds a great relationship with them. He will give us a good insight into the game this evening. Tom also, uh, he captained Sebba in 2007. And thirdly, we've got, and lastly, we've got uh, James Doherty. Uh, he played for Cornish Pirates, leads Carnegie, and has coached the National League uh, for several years. Uh, he's coached from year five-year-olds right the way through to, uh, to pro athletes. Uh, he's a typical standoff, uh, scrum off, uh, absolute handful on the pitch, uh, delightful in the clubhouse. So welcome, guys. Um, we've also got John Fletcher here this evening. Thank you very much. Uh, John works on our summer courses. Uh, he's the, uh, the England youth team for years and his success with them has been uh, immeasurable. Uh, John's a big thinker of the game and I'm, and I'm sure we'll ask some difficult questions of the lads. Before we start, can I just go, go through to you three guys, just give us a very sh short snapshot of your career uh, for me, please. Uh, just of uh, when you left Sebba, uh, what, what was your very brief background? If I come to you first, Tom, welcome. Oh uh, yeah, um, so I left school, went straight to Saracens. Um, one and a half years there, a lot of injuries, went straight to Quinns, um, had six and a half years there, and then two years at Yorkshire Carnegie, and I've recently retired. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, Carl, welcome. Hello. Uh, yeah, so I, I, um, I left St. Burn. I was lucky enough to sort of go straight into that first team environment at Sale Sharks, and I spent four years four years there, then moved on to Bath Rugby, um, spent five years there and at the time it was, you know, I was falling a little bit out of rugby so I thought let's change things up and move over to France. So I've been here for five years now and like you say, my, my contract's up but hopefully Cassin can be the good agent you've, you've said and get me a, a new deal. <laughs> Thanks Carl, we'll definitely come back uh, later to your transition from uh, Bath to France, but we'll do that later. And uh, James, welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah, so mine was slightly different to the other boys. Uh, didn't go straight into professional rugby at all. Uh, went to university at Leeds and combined my studies with uh, playing at Wharfdale, which was an amazing club for me and a bit of a home from home. Uh, and then through the England Counties pathway, was picked up um, to play for, to my, for my first professional contract at the Pirates couple of years there um, and then managed to get my, my move north again where I felt more comfortable and uh, up to up to Leeds as it was then for three years there before going into teaching and, um, and then returning back to Wharfdale. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so I, I'll start off if I may and then I suppose the conversation will flow. John uh, Fletcher will, will jump in and we'll, we'll go from there. People at home feel free to, to, to ping questions through on the chat and we'll manage our way on manage our way uh, through that um okay so first question i think i'm going to come to you actually first james uh i had master dan harrison your good mate uh, he's coached he's coached your wall to huge success um he's now the headmaster of the school he talks to the school absolutely every monday and he always mentions our core values uh, humility, ambition, resilience, and of course, kindness, and how essential it is for, for boys and, and girls and suburbians to live their lives uh, with these values. Now, stories are emerging about high-profile players branching away from the RPA and setting up uh, groups to maximise commercial endorsements, deals, maximise money. It's, it's, it's a tricky question, really, but are we going away from our core values 
uh, from Rugby Union? Has the game lost some of its integrity? I'll put you straight on the spot there, James. Um, I don't know. I think the, the game has obviously changed and the other guys are probably better um, better place to talk about money because uh, I earned four-fifths of not a lot for a while. But um, it's... Uh, I think the players are they're under a lot of pressure. There's, it's a small window of time to earn money. Um, and I think, you know, providing that they, they give everything they can on the pitch, then their, and their endeavours off the pitch should be encouraged. Um, you see lots of boys that are setting up businesses on the side or uh, learning courses. I know Saracen's a, a big on it. A friend of mine, he's, you know, he's down there and he's, he's been put into a, into a business world and getting experience there. So it's, um, I think that's important for players to, to have the opportunity to do other things outside. Um, but it's a difficult one. I think, I think they've got to earn the money when they can. Um, but also, a lot of people on the outside don't quite see what goes on in, in a club. And the traditional values are generally there. You know, the socials are still, are still great. The, the camaraderie amongst players is pretty, pretty solid. Um, and I think there's still that rugby ethos that will always be there. No, absolutely right. And I think we'll, we'll compare the, the, the club, the, the ethos within clubs it, as we go on through the night. I'll be interested to, to compare uh, Saris with, with Leon, actually. But we'll, we'll, we'll come on to that. What about you, Tom? I mean, you're right on the front line. You're an agent now. You're, you're, you're balancing uh, both sides of the argument. What, what, what are your thoughts? No, I, I, I agree with those there. I feel like from a playing point of view, like young lads are still going out on loan and experiencing like that that culture, that that proper rugby, like, what makes you. Um, from a financial point of view, I feel like, well, personally, I've had an awful lot of injuries. I, I, players do have to look after themselves. Um, I don't feel like that takes away from the game because I feel like every club I've been to, the lads are, are usually spot on and the, the culture's there. We're not going away from anything, but I do feel like players do need to maximise what they're earning or, or just developing as people outside of rugby like that was just said. Thanks, Carl. You're, uh, you're 30, are you 30 now? Don't offend you, 29, 30? Yeah, 30, 31. 30. 28 this month. I'm uh, so you're on, the, you're on the free market. You are coming home for, with your family, back to the UK. Uh, obviously, you're looking for a big club. What, what's your... What, um, what would you be looking for in a, in a club? Is it down to who pays the biggest bills, or what? What, what would you be looking for in the yeah, next? Just, go, just going back to that that question, Tom and Doe has answered. I, I I personally think that you know if if the players are wanting to break away and set up a, a new union for themselves, and I think that can only be a good thing because um, you see a lot of the contracts now there's not that much security in them that you know you're one injury away and potentially they can it's quite cutthroat the contracts at the minute and for an RPA to to be seen to be representing their players having the same clauses that are in them contracts you know I would question do they really have our interests at heart um, so I, I personally think it can only be a good thing if if the players are thinking about branching off and, and protecting themselves it's not about the money or pay cuts for, you know in this instance for me, it's about uh, you know protecting the players and and um, having some security because we give we give a lot to the game. Um, and to answer the, the, that question, uh, I'm probably looking for you know a, num a number of things. Obviously, I'm coming to potentially the end of my career. Uh, yes, you know I want to earn money, but I've also got four kids now, and um, you know ideally it would be great to be a, be around my family um, and. And just start thinking. I've got, I've got things to think about, like kids schooling, you know, getting my kids into the English school system. So it's, you know, it's not, it's not a, an easy, easy decision at the moment. No, absolutely. Uh, Carl, we'll stay with you if, I don't, if you don't mind. Uh, you say you, you give a lot to the game. So you have absolutely given a lot to the game. It's quite literally written all over your face. Um, <laughs> you've made the uh, the difficult decision to go to France when you were quite, you know, you were in your late twenties. Uh, obviously ruling you out of England, even though you, you, you played for Saxons. It was a difficult decision for you. What, what was the, the driving motivation to go to, to France? Uh, well, I spent, 10, I spent 10 seasons in England and, and um, you know, a lot of the same stuff, same, same, same old. And 
I sort of realised I'd got in my career had started to, you know, to dip a bit, and and I just, I just need needed for myself as well to to get that drive back and do and do something do something else, have new teammates, you know, to impress. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, for a player, it's about the respect you earn from from your teammates, and and with that comes you know making better choices, you know, whether that be outside the game, and you know it really helped me to to get a lot more professional by changing it up. Um, so, yeah, that was the, the main reason, really. I just needed to freshen things up and have a, have a change because I, I knew I knew what I could do. And I, I felt like, you know, I was probably, my, my career was stagnating a bit and I needed to change that. That's, that's interesting. Can I come, uh, c- c- come to you, Cass? Can you explain, uh, obviously, you're, you're at, you're at Saris, um for a few seasons. Can you just talk about your, um, your your typical training week before you approach a big game on a Saturday? Um, Monday, usually just like a, a recovery sort of, yeah, recovery unit session in the morning, um, then a meeting, then Tuesday, <clears throat> tin hats on, go through the, the uh, meeting on the, on sorry, a meeting about the fixture on Saturday. Um, units again, probably have a speed session before then, lunch, then we'd go through basically team scenarios. Wednesday off, Thursday, sort of like another hard team session, then Friday, team run, then game. Stuart, can I jump in there, mate? Yeah, Please. absolutely. Uh, Tom, what would be your ideal session? What would be your best ever session? And actually, can, can the other two lads think about that as well? So what would be your... Best ever session? Yeah, well, not what was your best? How would you design a session that would be best for you? What would it look like? Um... A lot of game scenarios. How so I'm mixing it out. So I'd go from, I don't know, sort of a team play straight into a game. So 15 on 15. That's how I benefited quite a lot from doing that sort of stuff. Um, showing different pitches. So as soon as we've done our meeting on a Tuesday, and I know exactly how someone defends if they've got a high line out. High line coming in, then that ball over the top or looking to put the ball behind, that's what I sort of enjoyed doing. Um, I'd like to do it more team instead of just personal. Okay, cool. Uh, Fernsey, what about you, mate? What would your uh, ideal session look like for? Yeah, similar to Cassidy, but believe it or not, you'd probably think it would be a two-by-two square drill and contact, contact, but um, no, I'd I, you know the, the most enjoyable sessions are the ones where you're playing games and a lot of ball in play and um, yeah and, and, and play continues even if there's a mistake you know the, the reaction from turnovers and things like that they're, they're the best sessions for me. Why? What, what, why do you feel it's really good for you? Uh, because because in the game you know traditionally you you probably well going through my career traditionally you probably setting your ways and you make you'd, and I think you'd, you'd have an exit and you'd, you'd do this, this, this and that's what you do whereas if you play if you play them types of games and you're training that way then um, you can catch you can catch teams out and uh, you know go against the normal Okay, cheers mate Dawes, I'm going to ask you the same question I'm going to guess what you're going to say you're going to say your ideal session would be to pass against the post make sure <laughs> your feet are in perfect position and your hands following through to the target no, no, no. Am I right? No, not at all. No, no. I, I was, I was thoroughly enjoyed sort of scenario stuff. So, um, Jimmy Lowe's was mad as a box of frogs on a lot of things, but he was great on throwing scenarios at you. You know, you five min, five minutes to go, such and such a point. You know, these that this is the scenario, bringing a player off, um, and really making us think. And especially as a nine, being in one of those sort of decision making roles, you know, for the team and how we would attack or how we would defend. Or how would approach a penalty situation? Um, I used to love that sort of stuff. It just made it more interesting. Um, and if I could, you know, have a have a pink bib on with no contact, that was even better. So, Mate, I just want to I just want to stay on this. So uh, the rest is I just want you to give me a number. What percentage of your training would look like your ideal training session? So if yeah, so just to think of a number. Um, I'm, I'm going to say with you, Doors, quickly. What percentage uh, of training? Was when, I, when I was when I was playing myself, 
Yeah. It was probably 40%. Fernsey, what percentage of your trainings? Yeah, probably yeah, probably around 40% because as a forward, we spend a lot of time while well, our back rows are standing around watching the second rows lift and jump. So, yeah, it's probably 40, 40%. Yeah, it's bigger. Cass, what about you, mate? What percentage of all of your training? It's probably lower than that. From the <laughs> Sarries was a bit painful. <laughs> Right, and what about Quinns? Just kick chase, wasn't it? Yeah, chase. Oh, Quinns was great for that. Yeah, I'd say Quinns was a lot higher. Okay, cool. And what about uh, Yorkshire? Um, probably like Sarries. Okay, cool. Cheers, guys. Thanks, Stuart. Yeah, Thank no you, problem. Uh, James, if I, if I come to you, you, you obviously went into, you got a degree, then went into the, 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 the championship. Can you talk me through the kind of the highs and lows of, that, uh, of your, your, your experience down there in the championship? Yeah, it's a, it's a tough league. Um, you know, lots of, uh, lots of boys are, are sort of scrapping it out. There's a real two-tier system in the championship in terms of finances, resources. Um, you know, I was fortunate enough to play at two clubs who we, we never really wanted for anything. We were, we were pretty well looked after. Um, and, you know, it, it can be a pretty grueling league um lots of travel you know we're not flying anywhere we're on a bus especially when we're in Penzance um I remember playing Birmingham away on a Friday night game and we didn't stay over we drove there in the day and we drove back that night um you know that was it's pretty grim so there's, there's a lot of travel and um being away from my family was was tough initially um friends being quite isolated or felt quite isolated um but then you know the highs I was lucky enough to we we had in my five years at Pirates and Leeds we had sort of three playoff runs, uh, played in a played in a playoff a uh, couple of playoff finals, couple of semi finals, never won any of them, which was great. But um it was, you know, there's, there's some fantastic memories, some fantastic friends. Um but it is a it's a really tough league when, you know, the reward financially and, and everything isn't necessarily there for the long term, but you're still playing a great game and in a tough league. You are and I just want to pick up on that. I just I I, I often think now that the, the biggest curse for, for young boys now is to be quite a good player. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. Because if you can't make the dizzy heights and make hundreds of thousands of pounds like Carl, you, you, you're, and you're in the championship, you're fighting out week in, week out for a couple of grand a week, a couple of grand a month. And, and that, all of a sudden, you know, you get injuries, you go through to your late 20s, early 30s, and you haven't you haven't built up a career for yourself. You haven't got yeah. enough money. You're rattling around in that league, and ultimately uh, you end up on, on the scrap heap. It, it, it's tough. Now it the league the league's a fantastic league, and it is. Tough, but there are victims. Yeah, there are, and I think that's that's a personal choice, isn't it? I mean, lots of players. You still get lots of time to be able to do things. Um, when I was in Cornwall, I was uh, volunteered at a school to get work experience because I sort of thought that that was a a route I was going to take. Um, there are plenty of opportunities for boys to to learn online or or do some part time learning. And I think lots of clubs now are coming away from trying to be full time. Richmond seem to have a fantastic model. Yes, they're well connected and in a great location. Um, but that sort of semi pro edging towards you know more professional in terms of time spent um, balance between people having careers having. Uh, interests outside of rugby and then also playing a good standard on the weekend. Um, I think they, they seem to get it right. And a lot of clubs are, are <coughs> follow suit. Absolutely. You obviously, you, you obviously went and got a degree first. How valuable looking back was that? Or could you have could you've gone into an academy as an academy player first uh, and, and worked top down? Yeah, the, the, I remember having the conversation with with Dan Harrison on, on tour, we were in, um, in Australia in, uh, finishing our tour off in Sydney. And, uh, my, my, um, my dad was there and we were, we were sort of chatting it through and those two had a private conversation and, and discussed sort of options and, and Leeds Academy at the time was, was an option, but also, you know, having been not a, wasn't a world beater by any stretch of the imagination at, at 16 or 18 physically probably wasn't ready for, for professional rugby. Um, and had an opportunity to to go to university, having got some good grades. It was it was sort of a no brainer for us. Really, we thought 
you know, you're only one injury away from uh, from that career ending. And it for me, it worked out. It was the right pathway for me. Thank you. I just, I, I'm just going to ask <coughs> Fernsey a quick question, and then Fletch will come to you with the uh, question board if that's okay. Fernsey, you've had obviously had lots of challenges. What's been the biggest challenge you've you've faced uh, faced in in your career uh, thus far, and, and how have you overcome it? Uh, it'll probably be my uh, my second ACL uh, injury on my on my on my right knee because um, you know the first one it was. It was right at the start of my career and I didn't really have a level to sort of judge, judge myself. I just sort of said, right, that's happened to me. Um, what can I do? I can get as strong as I can in the gym. I'm going to do that. Uh, and yeah, and because it was at the start of my career, um, mentally it didn't, it didn't really uh, affect me as, as it probably should have because that was a big, serious injury at the time because, you know, though, uh, it's, it's advanced now, but at the time it could have ended my career. Um, so, but, so I had that one but then the, the worst one was the second one because I'd, I'd had a, three great seasons in France I was, I was nominated for top 40 in player of the year I was um, you know, probably the best Big DeVito will say he wasn't but I was probably the best um, number 8 in the league at the time and then I just signed my new deal at Lyon you know, things were looking really good and then I had the second ACL and also a micro fracture, uh, which is where they drill into your, into your bone. So it calcifies and that pretty much acts as a cartilage. Uh, so, yeah, that, that happened. And then because I'd, I'd been at that level, that trying to get back to that level has been really tough. Um, you know, I feel I'm, I'm getting there now. And, you know, even two years, two years on, it's still, I'm still getting better each, each game. Um, but yeah, because of that, you know, where I was and having to get, trying to get back there mentally, it was pretty tough. Thanks, Carl. John, do you, you, I've just noticed that the, it, the question board's flickering away. Do you want to have a go at a few? Yeah, mate, you're freaking me out calling me John, but uh, I'll go with it. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Fletch. <laughs> seriously. Um, yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a couple of similar questions. It's around takeaways from said or... So. What's the yeah? What uh, what were your takeaways from your experiences at Sedbergs? Yeah, do as you can go since you're on my screen. Um, for me, it was the was the freedom. Uh, so, freedom to express yourself. Dan Harrison was was at the time first team coach, um, and it sort of embodied what was the what the school was around about for me. Really, that freedom to try anything and, and encouraged actively encouraged to try things that you weren't necessarily great at. Um, you know, whether that be going to debating or uh, musical theatre or singing or whatever it might be, um, give something different a try. And on the pitch, it was sort of replicated in, in our rugby. Um, Dan was never a structure man. Um, he would just empower you to, to go out and play, try and give you the uh, opportunity to, to test your skills and play. Um, but the biggest thing for, for me was was how they made you feel. So I always felt valued, always felt loved, always felt cared for, um, especially uh, in the boarding house, but also on the rugby field. You know, Dan, he will, I hope he isn't watching because I don't want to be um, pumping his tyres too much, but he, uh, he genuinely made you feel great. And uh, that, that made, made, well, brought out the best in, in every player, I thought. Well, I'm not surprised that you say that. Cass, well, what about you? What were your takeaways from said? Um, personally, I think the work ethic. So whether that's from watching, I don't know, the, the fell runners or the fifth rugby team just give out absolutely everything. I just enjoyed how everyone just got stuck in and, and grafted as hard as they can. And I feel like that was that was huge for me going forward as a as a player and a person. I just you don't get worried about anything, you just get stuck in. Um more personal to rugby, just the communication skills that Dan just made you talk, made you commentate on the game. And I feel like I still say to anyone, if you're a loud rugby player, it just makes things a lot easier. You're helping everyone around you and, you, and you're more sure in yourself. They're the nice. two main things for me. Awesome. Cheers, mate. Fernsey, what are you thinking? Uh, just uh, c confidence for me because, you know, but before I went there, um, you know, was, wasn't very confident, and I went to Sebra, so I threw myself into everything. So whether that be, 
you know, being one of the ugly sisters in the, in the pantomime or, you know, singing in the male voice choir. Um, you know, a lot of, I did a lot of things that gave me a lot of confidence and, and that, um, that, that camaraderie, uh, you know, living, living in the boarding house with, with the lads you're playing on the weekend, um, you know, is, 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 a, is a great thing. And that's, you know, why, why um, I believe that Sebrel always has a very strong team. Um, you know, and and ultimately, even in the professional game we're in now, it's it's for me, it's about still about relationships and you know going that extra mile for someone. Um, so for me, yeah, that that uh, camaraderie. And how could the what stuff could they done better to make the transition a bit easier? So think now about you leaving school that that period of time where you've left school. Looking back on that, what else, what could the school have done even better? Um. Oh, it's a difficult one. I, 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 I mean, I don't. I, I personally don't feel like they could have done more. Um, you know, there's still OS events and things like that where you can you can go and I still keep in touch with with loads of the guys there. Um, so I, yeah, I can't really think of anything they, they could have done done better. Doors, what, what about you, mate? You've uh, recently gone back as a teacher and then involved with Jason Duffy around the courses and various of our work. What do you um, think could do even better to help people prepare for that transition? I don't know, I think that's tricky. I think the, the connection with the old boys community is amazing. I think that's, that's definitely one of the strengths of the school, whether it be through staff or um, former pupils or current pupils, there's that connectivity there throughout. I'm do better, mate. I'm, no, but, I'm, but, well, I'm coming on to it. I think that maybe that could just be a bit more, more formalised in terms of um, it could be like you know a bit of a mentor scheme, or um, just for those people transitioning. If there's a it, the OS uh, community is amazing and it's done great. I think if anything, if that was formalised for you know for instance a player leaving Sebba two years after Fernsey or Cass, I'm sure they would have really benefited from um, you know a web chat with them or, or whatever. Just just you know check in once a month and see how they're getting on. Having that formalised a bit more would probably be a good thing for them. Cool. Cass, last one. What are you thinking? Um, I mean, this is really just personal to me. So um, maybe if I had a little bit more exposure to men's rugby, like I don't know how you could have done that, but getting, what was that, 84 kegs going into the first team, that was the only thing that I feel like could have, I, maybe me personally should have, not got a bit too far ahead, but I feel like from my point of view, if I had a little bit more exposure to men's rugby, that would have benefited me. That's an interesting point because obviously that that you know that, that that's under eighteen rugby around the country full stop. You know, should they should under eighteen boys go straight into that highest level? Uh, Fletch, are they uh, you know even the uh, uh, under eighteen England? Are they ready even to play to, to play in the championship? Generally speaking, um, I mean it. Clearly depends. Some positions would be, um, yeah. Some positions would be easier. George Ford, seventeen years of age in the senior game. I mean, he looked as though he'd been there all his life. Um, very low in injury. Clearly, there'd be other positions. So, what would it would also not only depend on the position, but also what you've been asked to do. So, I think part of the stuff that I see is that they have a certain role and function within. The schoolboy teams, and they go to the, some environment, it's very, very different. Um, and then you're probably more likely to, you know, to get hurt, I would imagine. Um, so I think it depends on the position. I think it then depends on what that environment is. Clearly, academies and people responsible for development are thinking long and hard about what environment they want people to go in, because nobody wants anybody to get injured. Um, I think it happens probably too often, both in terms of the load around the training and then the different types of rugby. I think we're, I don't think we're losing that many players, but I definitely think people are spending too long injured first year out of school. That would be my observation. Yeah. What's your thoughts on it, lads? Around stuff that you notice about other people? I, Both of I, you said, look, I left school and I got injured. Or two well, of you said that. I, um, I remember playing away for Wolfdale in men's rugby, but in, there's an argument that actually in the lower leagues in that sort of national one area, you're probably less protected. I think the Premiership's probably a cleaner game. I remember running on the blind side against 
Cluck Eaton in the Yorkshire Cup and getting filled in by John Burntley, 18 years old, just didn't want it at all. Um, and you learn pretty quick not to run down a blind alley on your own. Um, you know, and it's a, it's a steep learning curve. Uh, but physically for these guys playing at, at the top level, that the sheer impacts are, are huge. And I think, you know, players probably do need to be gradually, um, gradually introduced to that. Anybody else want to share that? Cass, Cass, do you want to talk about Because you were, you know, I mean, without me blowing smoke up your backside, uh, you, you made the decision not to come onto at Argentina when I was coaching. Um, and you went to Saracens and, um, yeah, I mean, you spent some time injured there, didn't you? What, what, what were your thoughts? May I had a shoulder off if I missed that Argentina one. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, don't, I, I, I think... I think going into a first, yeah, hindsight, going into a first team environment probably wasn't the best for me. Um, everyone's panicking about trying to put weight on you, but yeah, I, I won't be able to, won't be able to call it really. Cash, you need to put ten p in your Wi-Fi meter. We're losing you a little bit, uh, <laughs> Doers. Um, Doers, I, I would not embarrass you by saying this. You went to Pirates. Are you the best player in? Uh, in, in that league, certainly in, in, in the north of England, you went down to Pirates and the captain was a scrum half. You spent a lot of time uh, holding a tackle shield. Uh, that is an, a real waste uh, of incredible talent. Um, what can be resolved about these uh, these young lads spending a lot of time not playing the sport? Yeah, I mean, I, I learned a lot from Gavin. Was a, he was a hell of a captain. He was an unbelievable leader uh, and he was a blooming good scrum half as well you know he had his um I think we were very different players he was quite uh, combative um very strong and whereas I clearly am not um but you know we sort of complemented each other in terms of time off the bench and, and playing and, and my, my game time did increase over the over the few years I was there um mentally it's pretty tough being being the second fiddle and, and knowing your second fiddle um you know there was a moment, especially in that sort of third year, I'd had a great pre-season. Um, I'd captained them for the first three games and got my head, you know, felt like I was number one. And then all of a sudden, it's you sort of pulled straight, pulled straight back and, you know, you, you, you drop down to earth pretty quick. Um, and that can, be, that can be really challenging. You know, you just think, well, there's nothing much more I can do. Um, it's, it's tough, but, you know, you, you, you live and you learn and, and you try and make the best of it. But that's the, the role for of a, of a coach for me because yeah. you, know, you look at someone like Saris, they tell players that they're playing three week the block of three weeks and then the next team is playing the next block of three weeks and now that that keeps everyone on board with with what they're doing and keeps everyone you know feeling feeling a big part of what what they're trying to trying to achieve and I think that that's the the main thing that that for a coach you've got to try and. Uh, keep everyone on board, even even if you, you know, you never play or you're holding the bag, like you say. You know that that's that's what coaches get paid for. You got to keep your players uh, buying into the, the the main goal. Yeah, and I probably didn't react very well to that when uh, because the communication probably wasn't the same as you're saying there, Carl. I, I you know, I. Well, no, it's not. It's, like, it's not. I mean, that's just Saris. Saris. That's what. That's one point why Saris are, are very good because right? not everyone's doing what. They're, uh, it doesn't happen at clubs like yeah. what you're saying is, is the normal I think well, I'll just pick up on that because there's a few questions uh, coming out about about coaching and, and, and managing a question on the board says who's the best coach you've had and what is the best uh, you know and, and what makes a great coach just, sorry so can I come to you first uh, Doris for me the best coaches I've had were uh, Dan uh a guy called Chris Sterling, um, and those two for the same reason, really, just how they made you feel. They were they were outstanding. Just empowered you, trusted you, uh, gave you freedom to play, gave you opportunity, valued your your opinion in me. You know, they're just generally good guys. They were they were they're brilliant. Um, best technical coach in terms of skill, pass, thinking uh, was Harvey Harvey Biljon. And personally, we probably didn't get on. He won't you know he won't mind me saying we had our differences. Um, but as a technical coach, his impact <coughs> and, and, his, and his variation and his, his creativity with coaching was, was excellent. What do you mean by technical coaching? 
so he would he would be great at the sort of what you would call the blocky stuff um the sort of repetition without repetition so we'd do you know thousands and thousands of passes but they wouldn't be the same um you know it wasn't as you said passing at a post it, you know they were they were pretty creative lots of variability he'd be swinging a bag at my head um you know he'd be trying to tap your heel you know th- there'd be lots of variables there uh, in that in that repetitive practice but like you say making it making it game realistic as best possible uh, and uh, Carl yeah probably my um my, be- uh, my best coach probably was, was Gary Gold and unfortunately he, you know he left quite early at Bath but I think if you look at the, the squad he created um over his time there uh, it really felt like we were we were going to do something but unfortunately he left um yeah so Gary Gold you know a lot of people might not agree with his uh, philosophy and how he wants to play but for me uh, yeah the squad he created and uh, the the environment around the club uh, was one of the best um, and then in terms of influence on my career I think I didn't realize it, realize it at the time, but Kingsley, Kingsley Jones at Sale like really, really accelerated my my career, and I got a lot of experience playing in the Premiership for Sale at a young age, and he really like backed me and gave me a lot of opportunities. So probably King Kingsley Jones up there as well. Oh, that's interesting. And then Cass. Yeah, I've been I've been quite fortunate. I think I think from. From an energy point of view, I think Paul Gustard, like, really, you'd run into anyone for him, like, you'd play for him all day, and every single session, like, the energy and the confidence that he'd get you doing stuff, I, I thought that was impressive. Um, Creative-wise, I thought Ben Ryan, for me, I thought, like, he literally just said, what do you want to do? And then <laughs> got us thinking about stuff, which I thought was really, I mean, that was under 18s, and that was, I think that was great at the time. Um and then Connor for the environment. I thought, I thought what he, well, when Quinns were, were successful and and started doing a, started doing well, I thought that was all about him just focusing on the individual and just do your job, which which I've which I've learned a lot from. Focus on what you can do. Mate, Jay, just on that, there's a shout out. So Chris Swinston, almost said Bergen, now uh, at Epsom. Uh, he, he, he's he's referencing culture. What stuff do you think is important around development of culture? So stay with you, Cass. You, you, you mentioned Quinns and you mentioned Connor. What sort of stuff did he do? What's important around development of good culture? Um, I think Carl's touched on it. If you have a, a common goal, but it's not, for me, it's just, it's not just the goal. Like, there's so many times where, uh, well, I think a culture is, is you come off the pitch, you know every single one of you is absolutely grafted and they haven't got the result. Like Connor at times just said, lads, you can't do any more. You've hit all your KPIs, which is what you've been focusing on. And there's times where you've you've played someone, you've done well, you've, you've beaten them well, but you haven't hit your KPIs and you've got sloppy. So I, I think for me, your culture is just keeping everyone in the same way, just progressing and, and just in the same, um, how can I say it? Yeah, just on the same wavelength, you know exactly what you're doing, do your job. And just focus on the process. So instead of just focusing on other things like cups, just do week to week. I, I think that's what I and everyone started buying in. I thought that was class for the culture. Fernsey, what's your view on culture? What's the what stuff do you think is important? What's the best you've been involved in? Um, well, the, when people start talking about culture, you hear one of the first words you hear is like honesty and stuff like that. And I suppose that links into what Cass is saying. So like honesty could be like you know, are, are you getting off the floor as quick as you possibly can? Are you resetting in, into into position as quick as you can? Um, you know, the, the, they're like little things within a culture that create it. Um, you know, like doing things, it's all very good, like doing things when the coach is watching, but, you know, as a team, are you, are you doing things while, while, while no one's watching you and things like that? And are you professional? Just... I think that all adds up. You put it in a pot, and it all adds up to a very, a very good culture if, if you get it right. Mate, what's the best culture you've had? So you reference Bath. Would Bath be it, or would there be other um, other environments? No, I think I think coming over to France uh, and and Lyon has been the best environment because I found when I when I was in England, 
that in, in England we, we used to focus very heavily on the process. Like how how do we get how do we get there? And, and we do this and that scrum. We we put our arm here and we get a ninety degree angle here. And then when I went over to France, they they focused more on the outcome. You know, so I, I went over there as a, as a ball carrier, and they went, "Right, Carl, you're a good ball carrier. Go and do that for us." And then, and I, I found that quite refreshing because I, you know, I didn't have loads of things going around my head. I could just go out and play play how I want. Um, and yeah, so I'd say in terms of a culture and how tight we were, Le- Le- Leon's probably the best because that's another thing as well in France. You know, we're quite emotional people, and we, you know, you really invest. They really invest in it and. We were a real tight knit team to go from probably there to to what you know potentially we could have been heading the final this season for the top fourteen. So that was the that was a real good environment. So. Doors, what do you think? It make culture. What's important to you? Um, I'd say the the best cultures are, are player led. Um, you know, I, I, I'll be honest. I've sat in some meetings where there's been a whiteboard at the front, and everyone's given out the same answers, and then it, that whiteboard's then put in the office, and it's never seen again. And I just think that's it's like a forced forced thing that people want to do in pre season. One of the best things we ever did, and this was in my time at Wharf, I was I think it was eighteen, nine, nineteen. Um, we walked up a blooming good hill. It was fairly high. Uh, came back down, camped out load of beers and pizzas and got to know each other. Just generally, just, just find out about each other. Um, we had some new lads and it was great to, to get to know my teammates. I think, you know, there's lots of, what the boy said is absolutely right in terms of a playing capacity. So that honesty and that trust of, you know, are you going to do what you need to do for the team and, and not take any shortcuts? Um, but I think, you know, it's, it's, it's not done in a boardroom. It's not done in a team meeting. It's done on the pitch, and it's it's done it's done off the pitch in terms of in terms of your socialising that that honesty and accountability to your, to your teammate. Absolutely, totally agree, and I think that's what why I said, but you know, we we've all before we even touch a rugby ball, we've we've got such an edge. You know, we we're in boarding houses, we, we you know we live in the same environment, we eat food together, we play together, we're here together twenty four seven, and you know we're, we're all you know. We all are in it together. We want to play hard, work hard for one another, and that's that's been the, the fundamentals to our success. If I just we've got pupils for uh, uh, young children for watching here from all all over the place, um, and obviously it's every every boy's dream to, to to play at the highest level. What advice would you have to to young aspiring uh, to boys that want to? pursue rugby in their career if I come to you first James because you're you're involved in education as well yeah I I would just say talk to people so get as many different uh, viewpoints as you can and that can be confusing but I think it's good to expose yourself to different environments and and understand there are different pathways into rugby so lots of young lads now just see academies as that is the only way you can get in and it's and it's clearly not you know you look at Don Brandt coming through into Harlequins from university uh, pathway there's still plenty of players coming through national one uh, championship into the into the premiership so there's lots of different ways in which that can be done um, and I think you, you've just got to have some sound advice so just just talk to people don't be don't be too tunnel visioned and you know that's sometimes a contradiction when you see these great documentaries you know Jordan how focused he was how determined he was but you know Jordan you know he's, he's one in a million you know it's, it's the, the, the majority of people have an opportunity to make it or not and there'll be varying degrees of whether that happens and why that doesn't happen or does happen and I think just understand that there's, there's more than one way to skin a rabbit getting into professional rugby so just just talk to people. Absolutely and Carl you you, you know you, you left here 18 you were a colossus you were a forward and you were, you were put straight into the sale sharks and they played you they blooded you nice and early as a young player uh, which must have been a fantastic experience for you. What what, what did you take from that, uh, and what what advice can you give to any any young lads? Yeah, it's pretty much what what Doe said there. Because because you're so obsessed with becoming a professional rugby player, and um, you know you're, you're so driven to do that, you you sort of you know you don't really you don't really think at the time. It's like right, it's the next it's the next stage. It's the next um, the next. Uh, level I want to get to. Um, so yeah, what Doe said there, just possibly taking, you know, a step back and realising that, you know, rugby isn't isn't everything. 
but yeah, it's a difficult one because if you want to, if you want to achieve and like and be the best, then yeah, you need that. You need that mental side of it, whereby you know you you're going to give everything, and that's all you ever want to do. But so so it's difficult. Um, but for me, I think going into the <coughs> life, I think you need a lot of self self belief um, and a lot of self awareness as well, because there's going to be people who who tell you you're not good at this or who tell you you're not good at that, and and um, unless you truly know what what your weaknesses are or what you need to work on, I don't think you, you know, you'll be able to change it as much as you you, you could. Thanks, Carl. And uh, Cass, anything from you? No, I I completely agree with them too. I think I think you just, yeah, quite similar to Carl. You just need to know exactly where you are. So be quite self-aware. Get as many opinion as possible, strengths and weaknesses, and and, and just focus on everything really. Um, if, another one that I'd say is like try and get yourself something outside of rugby as well, because that will massively come in benefit during your career. Um, but also starting, so you're not. I mean, all the three lads there, they would have had injuries and it would have been dark times. So that, that hobby would come in handy and it will take your mind off rugby. And then that's what I'd suggest. Absolutely. There's a question on the, on, on the panel here. If you would have your time again, knowing what you know now in hindsight, what would you do differently, uh, Carl? Um, you know what I'd do? I'd, I'd probably, if I could go back, I'd probably... Signed for St. Helens when I was 14. <laughs> really? Yeah, and and see see what it would have been like at rugby league because because there's a lot more time than you think. Um, you know, you, it's like we've said before, you can get an injury and your career is short, but there is actually a there's a lot more pathways and time for you to get where you want to go. So if I could, I'd, I'd just like to see how, how I would have gone there because I reckon uh, you know could have been quite a good rugby league player maybe <laughs> you've done all right in rugby union Carl you've done yeah, all right but just, just if I could go <laughs> back I would like to see you know yeah. whether uh, you know whether I, how, how I'd do that yeah uh, Dewis um, I'd probably I think I'd probably challenge coaches a bit more I think when I played there was a bit of a culture of just shut up and do um, and I mean, I did challenge him a couple of times and it got me in a bit of hot water, but I think, you know, there's probably a constructive way you can do that. And um, yeah, just <clears throat> probably, probably tried to get out of it, get out more what I wanted to, to happen or wanted to do. Um, I think there was, I think if you'd have honestly asked all the players there, like Fletch said before, probably only 30, 40% of training was actually that enjoyable. Mm -hmm. And it sometimes felt like they were filling sessions for session's sake and, you know, a team meeting about a meeting. And I think I'd probably, probably challenge the norm a little bit more. Um, I've just got a really interesting question that just popped up actually on the on the screen. Um, we've all spoken about injuries. Uh, should there be more support for the mental side of being injured? You could be secluded away from the team culture because you're not taking part of the session. So therefore, you have different different gym times, uh, solitary physio. Have you got any uh, any suggestions around that, Carl? You're, you've been broken a few times. You've had a, lots of months off. Uh, what do you think about that? Um, no, I think I think they could, they could they can do more. I think because uh, it's, it's it's really is a tough place to be because you know you you go from having a lot a lot of banter with, with guys and being around that team to you know doing little rehab exercises in, in an empty gym, um, and it's yeah it's a it's a lonely place. So um, yeah, I think I think the possibly could do, be doing a lot a lot more for injured players but I suppose you've got to take it on yourself to to keep, make sure you keep you keeping involved in the team and I know at Leon um, you know we do a lot of little skills with the, with the injured lads and keep them keep them uh, in and around the, the the first team so yeah absolutely one thing we do yeah but yeah I think I think it's really important because it's quite a you know, mentally, it's a, quite a dangerous time for, for sportsmen. No, absolutely. And mental health is so important. Doze, have you got anything to comment on that? Yeah, I'd just say communication. I think sometimes I've seen it in, in clubs. I was fortunate, you know, in, in terms of when I was playing professionally, I was quite lucky with injuries and, and pretty much uh, fully fit for the majority. And 
but the lads were just ignored. You know, the, I remember head coaches just just completely disregarding players. And I think that you know the best coaches are the ones that, like we said before, you know, they make you feel they make you feel great. You know, that's that personal relationship. And I just think communication would be would be would be key. Um, you know, if if you're in a long term injury, just having a having that chat with the the head coach or the forwards coach or whatever, have a coffee with them once a week just to catch up how you're getting on, how's your rehab, just to know you're not forgotten. Because uh, it, like Carl said, it can be can be a pretty lonely place when you're injured. Um, so I think that just to know you're loved. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, can I just jump in as a question from the group from Michael Davis just around the game evolving? Where, where do you think the game's going, lads? What What do you think we'll be talking about in three years' time? Um, I think we've seen from when from when we were all getting coached at the start. I think you've seen a huge uh, change in in the the way. The uh, rugby's coached, um, you know, it's a lot, a lot of uh, you know, player-led stuff. Player, players making decisions, uh, reading what's in front of them, uh, and that necessarily wasn't the case for when you know when we were coming through through the ranks. So I think that's the, the biggest change for me is is um, you know players players leading sessions and and um, you know solving problems uh, on on the go. Well, uh, just I just want to stay with you as a shout out to St Mary's College. I assume that's where yeah. you went. Well, what were your experiences there? Oh no, they were great. Um, you know, played played a bit, of, played football terribly there, um, and then you know played. That's where I started the rugby league, rugby league with them. They had a developed like a development program with St Helens there, and played a bit of rugby league and, and rugby union for them, and they were a great, great school and great, great memories there. Cool. Cass, what's your views, mate? Where do you think the game's gone from from your point of view? Uh, I just think it's going to get faster and faster. I think, um, I mean, just from seeing the academy lads now and what they're doing, like they're getting bigger, faster, stronger. Um, like what Carl said about the training as well, like they're pushing themselves, they're working out a lot more um, scenarios themselves, whereas probably back when some occasions I had to stick to a game plan and I had to kick chase, whereas these these lads are doing it on the pitch, they're thinking for themselves. I think it's just going to get faster and faster. OK, and what do you think that's going to mean for the players? So, say you were now a player, I'd said, but what stuff would that mean for you? I'm a player at Sedba. Yeah, so if you can think back, so imagine that you're now 17, 18 and you're thinking the game's going to get faster, how, how do you think Sedbo would, yeah, how well prepared would you be for that? I think it'd be pretty perfect for Sedbo. I'd yeah, I mean, enjoy game, it. Yeah, the game's, that, to, the game's starting to look a little bit more like how Sedbo plays in a in certain Yeah, way. I think mean, just challenging everyone's skill set. So a big thing for me, as soon as you leave school, you, you start to think, why are these lads, professional players can't pass or... How come our prop Hutchie can do a spin pass off his left, and I'm looking at my ten who can't pass to me off his left? So that, for me, I just think everything's just stepping up. And from a separate point of view, just that expansive rugby and testing yourself. I mean, the next thing for Sebra is to be able to kick, isn't it? <laughs> Steady on. Bit too radical that. I don't <laughs> think it's happening. Kicking this year. Do I want to bring you, mate? You're uh, you're a great visionary of the game. Well, Where do you think I, it's going to go? I think. It, a lot of it depends on world rugby. I think you know the the law variations that they've introduced over the last few years. They've tried to um, they've tried their best with the scrums and and things in terms. Of, there's lots of talk about stop clocks for scrums and things um, because the, there is some cynicism in 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 rugby and, and a lot of it comes down to to when the ball's tied up. Um, I think you know in terms of ruck speed, that's it seems to be getting faster. I think teams are deliberately slowing it down which seems really strange but um, you know the, the rook is as quick as you want it now because you can barely barely sneeze or you get penalised um, so World Rugby's influence on that will be, will be huge but like I think Cass is spot on I think it's going to get faster uh, you know and I think players possibly then maybe maybe slim down a little bit especially those those big boys in, in the front five um, we'll see see what Big Bill wants to do I think um, I think defenses are just too good now. Like as a ball carrier, like they they set early, they they're up in your face quick, and 
Try yeah. not running into him. <laughs> yeah. Hey, if you want, you want to try and carry the ball against some of the defense. No, no I'm all right. So many, there's so many people in the in the front line of defense, and um, you know that that's ultimately why now it's almost a bit like you're better off without the ball because you know defenses are so good. You might as well get rid get rid of it and get get out get out the you're off. Um, Don't say that. I'll start crying. <laughs> What's the solution, Carl? No, well, I've heard I've heard World Rugby are thinking about bringing in like a you know, like a forty twenty in, in rugby league, so that'll drop. You'll have to drop wingers and drop drop a lot more people in the backfield, which can only help for me. Uh, yeah, so I, I think, think that's a great idea. Yeah, I think my I think part of the solution would be on the kicking game. So yeah. um, teams and individuals, hopefully more individuals, will be more skillful around the kicking game, which will then open up the front field. Um, yeah. I, th- I think if you're a team that's got really skillful players, then I think I, f- I think that they will find space. They'll find opportunities in attack. I would have thought. Stu, mate, there's a couple of questions. I don't know if you want to ask them. Um, one is around Sedbra memory, so we can go down the um, we can go down this Sedbra memory lane. Uh, so, what is your best memory in a Sedbra shirt? And in addition to that, just stay on it. Who was your rugby idol? So, when you were a kid, who were the people that you, or person that you looked up to? Cass, you can go first, mate. What's your best memory? Who's your hero? Um, probably the first Roslyn Park. So, playing with Carl. So, fifth form. That was just class. That was talk about like ethos. Like, the lads just didn't stop running. I loved playing that. Um, I'm going to have to say Johnny Wilkinson. I think he was a massive thing about just growing up and because I'm originally from a football background, I thought he was class. That was the main influence for me. Nice. Doors, what about you, mate? What was your best memory? In the uh, best memory was either when it, uh, being awarded my brown blazer, which is a pretty special moment for, for anyone, or tour. When we finished, we were, I was lucky enough, Carl was on the tour as a fifth former, but um, I was up a sixth and we had a great send-off after we'd finished our finished our exams, um, you know, played some great rugby with your pals in, in Australia and New Zealand. Just life doesn't get any better. Doors, are you older than Cole Ferns? Yeah, two, two years older. Yeah. I was on a hard paper round. Honestly. A tough paper round, to be yeah. fair. And <laughs> mate, who's your idol? Who's the person who you look up to? Is I, I was probably the only scrum half growing up that preferred, uh, preferred Kieran Bracken. I thought he was a great player. Loved his service. Loved his play. Loved his hair. He was just. He was just great. <laughs> so yeah, for me, he was. That's he a was, big thing for you to be he fair. He was the man. Yeah. Fernsey, mate, what was your highlights? Uh, probably a memory that sticks in, in, in my head. Probably the best was uh, when we beat Landovery away because um, we we'd stayed over in the boarding houses the night before, and uh, they must have told everyone in the school to keep us awake and stuff like that because. They're all running around the, the halls with pots and pans, like keeping us awake. And then we played the game the, 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 the day, obviously the morning after. And um, um, yeah, we beat we beat them pretty pretty convincingly, uh, and they were quite a good team. So, and I just remember Ollie Brown coming to me saying, "He punched me, he punched me." The, the prop, he just, apparently the prop belted him, and that, that's just stuck in my head. I don't know why, but. <laughs> um, yeah, probably that that win, and then the Warwick the Warwick win as well um, was was a pretty special win because we had, we beat them like fifty odd nil, and they ended up win they ended up going to the Daily Mail final. Um, so you know we pretty convincingly put them away. Um, and in terms of my idol, probably I watched a lot of Richard Hill growing up, and um, yeah, he's probably someone I tried to uh, you know play like back in the day. Oh, mate, Hilly will be pretty pleased to. He'll be, he'll be pumped to hear that. I'll be. I'll send him a message later. Cheers, fellas. Guys, I've got some amazing memories of you guys uh, playing. Went on some amazing tours. We had some amazing games. Uh, you know, generally some fantastic times. Boarding houses around school. Uh, there were there were some great days, and they're still still happening now. I'm still here, 16 years later. Listen, I apologise to everyone at home and around the world sending in all these messages. We can't get through them. I'm afraid. Uh, we've, we've, we've been here for an hour so I just that leaves me to say thank you very much indeed to John Fletcher Carl Ferns James Dirty and Tom Casson I hope the next time we see each other we face to face or hopefully now Carl's moving to the UK we'll go to a home game 
see Carl and have a few drinks afterwards. But uh, thank you ever so much to everyone on the panel and uh, for everyone at home and watching.